I'm Helen Williams, and this is The Coach for the Coach, Connecting the Dots. There we go. Welcome to A Coach for the Coach, your normal Sunday viewing for coaches, a place for you to come and learn and get better at things that have nothing to do with on the court, but off the court stuff that makes you successful. So uh, I'm your coach, Helen Williams. I'm so glad to have you guys here again, and uh, we're going to have a really, really good show. Uh, per usual, just want to let you know if you want to get in contact with me or uh, see all the things that I'm doing for coaches, uh, follow me on Twitter at HMW Sports. Same for YouTube, HMW Sports, um, a coach for the coach on Instagram, and then my Facebook page um, called the Coach for the Coach. I have a Facebook group there, too. Um, so looking forward to interacting with you guys. If you have any questions about the show or anything, you can, you can contact me um, in either of those, uh, at either, either of those social media entities. Okay. Um, so the, the school I'm going to shout out today is Harvard University. Uh, I want to shout out Coach Tommy Amaker, doing some great things there. Uh, hopefully they'll get a chance to, to play this year with all the COVID and everything going, but um, he's a great guy. Does a really great job with his kids. And um, I, I just love watching him watching him work. So shout out to Coach Tommy Amaker at Harvard University. Uh, today's guest um, is a really she's. I, I would just I had her come speak to my class uh, one semester, and and we were talking about feedback and communication. And so I wanted to bring her on the show because she has a really intentional um, outlook and a consistent outlook at uh, providing feedback for her players and her team. So. Um, we're going to we're going to bring her on. We're, we've got Coach Beth Van Vliet um, from Georgia State. Uh, she is the head beach volleyball coach at Georgia State. Coach, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on tonight. Oh, no, I'm, I'm excited to have you here. It's just one of my favorite subjects to talk about. Um, I, I tell my clients all the time that there are three areas that um, you really need to focus on if you're going to be successful as a coach. And, and one is um, um, uh, management, uh, leadership, and then the third, which we're going to talk about today, uh, is communication. And specifically in terms of communication, feedback is so, so important. And I don't think that enough coaches think about that enough. I don't think they're intentional about that enough. And so that's kind of why I wanted to bring you on. We've had some discussions uh, before, and I just love the way you think about it. So I, I guess what I want to start off with is can you Give your definition of uh, what feedback is. Absolutely. Uh, for us, feedback is a calculated response to any action, behavior, um, or action. And we use feedback in hopes of helping an athlete or person to improve in that action, behavior, or action. That's a great academic uh, um, <laughs> definition. I love it. I love it. Um, so, so what does that mean for the normal coach, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of figuring out, you know, how they need to approach that with their team. Sure. Feedback for us, it's very much the heart and soul of communication when we're in the practice arena or the practice environment. And, um, you know, as a college program, yes, we're out there to have a, a good time, but we're out there to improve every time. And so, our, our practice environment is probably a bit more stern than um, an under six little league practice environment where it's about getting the, um, the, the snack at uh, after the game. So, <laughs> um, so the way that we use feedback is to communicate what our eyes are seeing and helping our athletes to put that into action. Okay, and then so how are you I said earlier that you're intentional about that, but but, but sure. can you be specific with the coaches about what that means based on what you just said? Yes, absolutely. So, and that's, I think, a, a big area that I have learned how to grow in the last couple of years as a coach. So if I'm watching someone break down their serving mechanics, um, my job as the person providing the feedback is to have a very specific eye and keep my feedback very focused on the specific area that we're training. So for us in beach volleyball serving, there's, you know, there's a toss, there's your hand contact. It's important what your wrist is doing. 
And so if I'm providing feedback to one of our athletes about serving, I'm going to pick one of those areas. And we're going to talk about that for an extended bit of time until the athlete can feel the differences that we might be seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we would move on to another very specific area um, of the serve. So then it might be the toss or something like that. So um, we have found that you don't want to dwell on it for 10 minutes because the athlete's going to become bored. Um, but you also don't want to just look at it once and then move on. So if it's something super specific, we'll go anywhere from five to 10 reps with that skill before we shift gears and talk about the next one. Um, but part of feedback mm-hmm. is it's also communication. So it's two ways. And as I'm talking to an athlete, I'm also asking if she understands what I'm saying, can she feel what uh, can she feel what her wrist is doing when I'm talking about it? Does she have questions about what we're asking her to do? Because all too often you will sit there and think you're having a great conversation with an athlete, but I'm I'm having yeah. a monologue and I've totally lost them. Um, and so that's something that um, how I was um, talking about growing within this is just this past week even. We brought, we've been bringing cameras out to practice and just little iPads and filming for like 60 seconds of an athlete performing a skill and then letting them watch that skill and then getting back in and doing it again. So instead of just having verbal feedback, we've also started using some visual feedback because we have so many learners on our team who are visual learners. And we can sit there and say, oh, you're doing this. And and we could say it 10 times and then they'll watch the video and they're like, oh, I'm doing this. And it's like, yes, that's how you learn. I don't know why I'm trying to make you learn another way. And so incorporating that visual aspect with using film has been really helpful for a lot of our athletes. And you bring up a really great point. Um, I know I used to get frustrated as a coach sometimes when I thought I was saying something. The way it is in my head isn't the way that they were necessarily receiving it. And it's key where you talk about the different ways to learn because everybody, athlete or not, we process information in three different ways. It's either verbal, it's either uh, auditory where we can listen to some things, and then uh, a lot of people are kinesthetic. They have to physically go through that. So you bring up a really, really important point in terms of because you learn a certain way doesn't mean that the person you're trying to coach and communicate uh, processes information the same way. Absolutely. And that's something that I did really wrong for probably the first three years Mm -hmm. of my coaching career is assuming that everybody learned how I learned. And it took me a a while to understand the different types of learners and what tools are helpful for them um, at a practice. So uh, part of feedback for us is also setting the expectation or providing the model of what we want it to look like. And so one of the things that we realized very early on was that if we just took a whiteboard out to all of our practices and had what we were doing like written down our entire practice and then we have a little um, sketch area so that we can draw some of the drills or the um, the positions that the athletes need to be in for the visual learners that helps them to create that visual of what the expectation is so that when we start providing the feedback they have the visual picture of what that should be Yeah, I know I tried to make sure that every practice that I put in something where I would uh, use each type of learning, whether it was uh, auditory, you know, visual or kinesthetic, and it seems like that helped. How how do you decide what which type of learning um, you're going to use to communicate with your player? Do you ask them? Is it trial and error or is it a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both at at this point, most of them know what kind of learner they are, or they'll tell us a story about a time they were learning and you can figure it out. So one of our athletes um, was telling me once that she used to get in trouble um, in class because she wouldn't be taking notes and she wouldn't be watching the teacher. She'd just be like daydreaming, looking around and the teacher would call on her and she would be able to recite everything the teacher just said. And so she is an auditory learner because she doesn't need the visual. Um, she doesn't need to be engaged in the learning, but she could just hear it. And I think that's from what my experience has been. I think auditory learners are probably the smallest group of people. Um, visual learners, they seem to be very, there seem to be a lot of visual and then kinesthetic learners for our, for our sport. Um, so oftentimes they'll tell you a story about a classroom situation and it's, easy to kind of pick up on the the clues of what kind of learner they are. But again, at the collegiate level, 
most of the athletes have figured out just from an academic setting how they learn best. And so we're able to capitalize on that self-awareness and use that in practice. And it, I give you a lot of credit for being able to engage your athletes in all the different types of learning. I still work really hard to, to get that into our practice plan. We found that setting up um, just demos for most of the drills will allow all of the types of learners um, to be at their mm -hmm. best so that they can be open and receptive to the feedback um, once we start getting into the actual skill. Do you find, this was just my experience, doesn't mean it has to be yours, but do you find that the freshmen are visual and that as they are, the kids are in your program longer that they're able to do more of the auditory um, uh, type of, of processing? Yeah, possibly. Um, I think part of it too is just you get used to a coach's style and you kind of memorize the types of drills mm -hmm. um, and things like that. But I'm trying to think through, I think most of the learning types have been pretty consistent for us um, across the board, but I'll keep thinking about it. I'll let you know as we go. On with the <laughs> yeah. So what, what made you feel like this was really uh a skill set that you needed to improve on as a coach in terms of providing feedback for your kids? I love this question. I uh, had the opportunity to play beach volleyball professionally for eight years. And so um, I coached on and off during that time, mostly um, peers and, you know, people that I, I trained with. But when I got into the college arena, I was all set. And I tore my ACL about six months before our inaugural team showed up on campus. And so I think that's been one of the biggest blessings in my career because I had to go from a coach who was probably gonna try to show the athletes how to do everything mm. to a coach who was gonna have to use my words and figure out how to be concise and clear with my words to teach instead of show. And I think that's one thing that we I've learned a lot from the different methods of coaching that uh, a coach or a teacher showing a class or a team how to do something, they don't, the, the athletes and the, and the students don't necessarily see themselves as that person. So it's always best if a peer can demo um, a skill that, because they can see themselves in that person's shoes. And so um, I had to learn how to communicate and how to coach without being active for the, my first six months. And it was a struggle, but it, it became really clear to me that that was a huge area of growth for myself and something that I took a lot of time to figure out how to um, kind of create it and make it my own signature. I think one of the best things that I did when I was coaching was um, learn how to swim because I had to be coached and it made me yeah. more aware of like the importance of the correct feedback, the importance of positive feedback and not that, you know, that negative feedback is a terrible thing, but I just realized as I was learning how to swim, how it made me feel so much better when I had the coach uh, be positive and say, yes, you can, you, you can do this. And yes, you can, you know, jump into the deep water when I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. That's <laughs> not, we're not, we're not moving to that part of swimming, but, but she got me to the point where I felt like I could I could jump in the water, albeit yeah. on the side, where I could yep. grab on the wall. But 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 the point is, I I think it's important for coaches if they can to go and be coached yes. at something so that they understand what that they get a this remember what that feeling is like of being coached because we're so far removed from it as um, as as college athletes. Yeah, I. I completely agree with you. So part of my um, recovery from, I ended up having three different knee surgeries, but part of my recovery was um, joining a group fitness class. And I had the exact same experience with um, recognizing which coaches um, really motivated me or which coaches really kind of helpfully scared me to be my best. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's really, it is really important to always be a learner. Right. Like I think the best coaches mm -hmm. are life learners. And a huge part of that is understanding how um, how we receive feedback and, and then how we can communicate with the person who is giving us that feedback. But I, I definitely have learned from the coaches that I've worked with in the group fitness um, class, trying to regain different um, uh, mobilities and strengths within my leg. And uh, and it, it was really eye opening. I completely understand your experience with with swimming. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. What are some common areas that kids struggle with, you know, when 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 they need feedback or they get feedback? It, because every kid, I think, wants it and understands yeah. that they need it. But but there's what areas do you think they struggle with in regards to that? I think there's several big areas. One is if they're uh, not getting the kind of feedback they want, it's very easy for them to tune it out. Um, so that might be um, if you're someone who wants really straightforward feedback and, and the coach is giving you like, oh, you're so good at this, you're so good at that, um, that may be kind of frustrating for the kid. Um, some, some athletes may have an over inflated idea of their abilities and they may get frustrated if the coach some <laughs> in today's world <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll go with maybe a couple um okay if the coach is giving them feedback that they think is um like too much of a beginner level and they think they might be beyond that um and oftentimes i think the, the very very best athletes in any sport will tell you you can't be too good at the fundamentals but Oftentimes the, the, the athletes want to progress so quickly so that they can feel competitive with their peers, with their teammates, that they're willing to shortcut some of those fundamentals. Um, and so that can be really frustrating when a coach is really trying to get them to work on the fundamentals and they, you know, the ABCs and they want to be working on the XYZs. I think that's yeah. really um, frustrating for, for some athletes. And then I think another place that I have seen a lot of struggle is when we are working with an athlete who's a processor someone who takes in information and slowly digests it. Mm. It's really easy for coaches to give those athletes a lot of information because they seem like they're not catching on to anything, but we're really overwhelming them and it ends up being way too much information. And so that's something that that's one of the things on our team that I work really hard to quickly figure out. And we don't usually have too many processors, but when we do, I, the sooner I can identify who they are. And then I know with those athletes, I keep the feedback very, very small, very, very focused, um, because I've, I've certainly done that to some of them. So, and that might kind of go back to the learning style, but I think that the athletes that really are hearing what you're saying and putting it into use, sometimes we can overwhelm them. Um, we can give too much feedback. Yeah. Better, better to give it uh, in bite size. Uh, yeah. Bite size yeah. 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 So like how do you make, yeah. How do you, how do you make it comfortable for the uh, for your kids, your, your athletes to come to you and tell you, well, this isn't working, you know, uh, because they're, I think today's kids are more apt than we were as athletes to actually go and, yeah. and and tell their coach, no, this isn't, you know, this isn't right. But but how do you make it comfortable for them and and help them explain to you uh, the best way that they learn or if something uh, is or is not working? Yeah, we have. Just being in the college setting, we're so lucky to work with them every day. So um, it becomes uh, a very respectful relationship, but also a very casual relationship. Uh, one of our rules for our staff is our doors are always open to the athletes. And then we'll also schedule weekly or biweekly meetings with them where they have to come in and talk to us. Um, and we talk a lot about having hard conversations and learning to advocate for themselves, especially as female athletes it's so important that they can come in and say, Hey, I'm doing really well at this and I'm struggling with this and can, you know, and, and I'm just, I'm not hearing you when we're communicating like this. Um, another thing that we'll do because beach volleyball is pairs and we have um, eight different pairs on our team, we will bring in pairs at the same time and I'll sit down with one of our pairs and say, all right, in a timeout, if you're winning, what kind of information do you want? In a timeout, if you're losing, what kind of information do you want? In a timeout, if it's a close game, and what you know, what kind of information do you want? And and as a pair, they will work together to kind of build that identity. But then individually, they'll also have preferences. So um, we've had athletes before that don't want any any kind of information on the opponent. Um, one athlete was like that. She's like, I just want to know what I'm doing well. And then her partner was like, I need to know everything that's open on the defense. And so we would have, you know, a, a 30 second team meeting with the pair and then kind of take each of those athletes individually for the last 30 seconds and give them the information that they needed individually. So um, we just have always had an open door. I ask for a ton of feedback from our athletes. Uh, we do semester reviews where they get to the, review us and tell us everything that we need to be doing better, that we can be doing better as a team, as a staff, as a, you know, as individuals. Um, but that's certainly something 
in practice daily that I'm asking them as well. That, that's a lot to remember. That's 16 kids that you've yeah. got to understand how they process information. I take a lot of notes. Um, but the <laughs> nice thing is, you know, they're here for four years. And so yeah. after you've known someone for a year, while they're going to mature in those next three years, a lot of their preferences don't change that much. And if they do, we've built the relationship where they can say, nope, that's what you needed to tell me last year. This is a new year. I need this kind of information. Yeah. Um, so it's really only learning from scratch, you know, three or four new people each year. So there, when we've had conversations, there have been three components to feedback that I want to yeah. want to focus on. Um, the, the, they are uh, frequency, context, and, and the actual message. So yeah. let's talk about the frequency first. Sure. What is that in terms of definition? Um, how do you decide, um, you know, how often you need to give them uh, feedback? Sure. So frequency for us is just how often, yeah, how often you're providing feedback. And um, we will look at that based on sometimes on the week, sometimes on the day, sometimes on, you know, the practice plan. Um, if we are having an individual practice, so if we're in a skill building phase, there's going to be a lot more intentional feedback with each of the athletes. And we'll usually do that in smaller groups. So instead of having all 16 athletes out at a practice at once, we might have six or eight athletes. And then we'll have our two or three coaches out there. So it's really specialized, customized feedback for the skill that we're focusing on with that athlete. Um, when we're in more of our season and it's more of a, a competitive time of year, then we're looking more at pairs and giving and giving them feedback. But it's not nearly as often because we want them to work on problem solving. And so part of feedback for us we'll use for building skills. But when it comes to creating, changing, and adjusting strategies, we'll almost, if, especially in a practice scenario, we'll let some of our pairs fail so that they learn how to do that better um, and they don't become so reliant on a coach's feedback simply because when we compete against other schools, there are times that not all of our pairs will have a coach and they have to learn how to problem solve and self-direct. That's, that's so important. Um, one of my favorite phrases when I was coaching was figure it out. <laughs> and, and, and the players hated that. And, yep. and obviously, if it was something that was important, then I would sort of prompt them and help them along. But I, yep. I intentionally created situations where I gave no feedback at all yep. um, and scenarios so that they would have to uh, figure it out. And I think that's really important because um, today's kids are hungry for feedback and they want to do well. And they want to make sure that it's right. So they're yeah. always asking, is this right? Am I, yeah. you know, what they want to know exactly what steps to take to get it right and get it perfect. And um, to me, it's, it's one of my pet peeves just comes from us testing kids way too much. Way too like much. there's always a, a right answer, you know, going through through school. And so that's a that's a habit that you really have to break them of in terms of helping. Them. And it's a life skill, too, that sports teaches yeah. them. Um, that that you need to figure it out and that w i think one of the jobs as coaches is to create an environment a nurturing vi environment where it's okay if they figure it out and it's wrong you right. know we can we can work on that but you got to be willing to take that risk to do it yeah. and maybe you end up doing something a way that i'd never thought of that's actually better but but you need to make it um comfortable for them to fail as you mentioned earlier yeah yeah, we applaud failure on our team all the time. Um, we the the three and this is getting a little bit off subject, but our three keys are communication, attitude, and effort. So if those three things are a hundred percent and we're failing, we're failing in the right direction. And I think that actually can be tied to feedback because while I'm not necessarily giving them words, they're feeling that emotion. And so I think like feedback can be. Um, verbal, it can be nonverbal, it can be emotional, it can be their response to um, to a problem or to a failure. And oftentimes, that's what's going to prompt the athletes to go back and figure out how to do it better the next time. And so it's almost feedback that they provide for themselves simply because they're frustrated. Yeah, and you, you bring up a great point. A lot of um, feedback is nonverbal. And mm -hmm. so I, I know as coaches, we need to be very aware of the tone of our voice, um, facial expressions, 
um, you know, body movements when, when things happen. We just, we don't know that we're doing those things, but the yeah. kids see it, um, you know, right away. Absolutely. And one of the challenges we have with beach volleyball, uh, because we're a spring sport, we start playing in February and we are oftentimes out there in 30 and 40 degrees. So I'll be sitting on the side just shaking, like so cold. I'm like, I got to look calm for them right now. It's a tight match. I'm like, I got to stop shaking because I'm shaking because it's freezing, not because I'm nervous. Um, but I, that is absolutely like, you'll see, you know, and I don't think it happens so much these days, but the coaches who throw the clipboards, um, you know, even if you're just tapping your foot or shaking your leg, uh, I try my hardest to remain level-headed, but I, I know I'm not. Like, I, I get so excited for the successes when, when a team is really playing well. Um, but it is, like, the, the nonverbals, even from their, their partners and from their teammates, right? Like, they're constantly getting feedback on their effort or their attitude or how they're communicating because they can read the body language of their partner. If their partner feels frustrated or if their partner seems to be excited and supportive, that's not always conveyed through words. Oftentimes it's through the actions or the, the expressions. And I think as coaches, the nonverbal disappointment is probably the very strongest type of feedback that we have, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I think that's totally true. And, 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 this, this brings me to another point in terms of what you're talking about with the partners um, and, and frequency as well. Do you have them have conversations about what they want to hear from their partner and how they want to hear it and how often? Absolutely. Um, because one of, so we were just, we watched um, a webinar last week as a team and the, the, the two athletes were beach professional beach volleyball players. And they were saying that, you know, the golden rule is to treat others how, how, you want to be treated, but the platinum rule is to treat others how they want to be treated. And I think oftentimes, especially in pair sports, you know, if I like, um, if someone's setting me and I like to have a set that's high and tight to the net, then if I, I'm going to set my partner high and tight to the net, because I think that's the best set and that's what she's going to want. But maybe she wants a set that's low and off. And if she doesn't tell me that, then I, I don't have a crystal ball and I, and I can't read that. So we talk a lot about the importance of understanding what it is that your partner wants and not, um, you know, we, we always say, you don't love someone how you want to be loved, love them how they want to be loved. And, and it's the same thing for, um, for setting, for attacking, for teamwork in any way, shape or form. The better you understand the people you're working with, the, the better it is to play cohesively. And that, that's why coaches are, always, that's what we mean when we say you guys need to talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. we, we need to say it the way that you just said it, but we get frustrated. <laughs> We're like, you guys aren't talking, um, yeah. you know, in, in our conversation. Um, yeah. so, so let's move on to context. All right. Sure. So we've got the frequency, how often let's talk about the actual uh, context of the message. Okay. And one more thing that I wanted to bring up with frequency um, is that I think it also ranges if you're working with um, uh, someone who's new to a sport or new to a skill, mm. as opposed to someone who's been, who's been there. Um, and I think, Good point. Often, yeah, so I think that was one thing I just wanted to add mm. is that frequency is dependent on the type of practice that you're having, whether it's an individual or, or team practice, but also the experience that an athlete has with whatever you're teaching. Um, and I think that, that it decreases as they become more of a high level elite athlete in that regard. Um, okay. okay. So going on to, to context, um, context is a hard one because context is so much more based on how an athlete is hearing that your voice or hearing what you're saying okay. than how you're actually conveying it because their reality, like their perception is their reality. And especially if, if the athlete's the one who's, who's doing all the hard work, who's feeling all the pressure, um, how the context comes across can be um, ex wildly inspiring or incredibly deflating for the athlete. And so I think it's very important in that regard to, uh, again, understand how the athlete, like what kind of information he or she wants um, when they're struggling and how they how they best receive it. Uh, and, and then also how that athlete wants to receive information when he or she is thriving. I think it changes um, tremendously. So I'll give you an example. Um, 
we, so again, back to one of our processors, we have found with her that when, if she's the person who's feeling all the pressure in the game, if she's getting served every ball and the other team is making her play every single point, if her partner asks her a question, it's overwhelming. But if her partner says to her, hey, I'm going to set you higher, she then can agree or disagree because she'll know that inherently. Um, but if her partner says, hey, where do you want me to set you? That, that's too broad um, of a message. And so for this, for some of these athletes, like that ability for a coach or a partner to make the, the scope of the skill a little bit smaller, I think can help tremendously, um, especially if they're the person that's feeling the pressure in a game. You know, that's so important because we as coaches, we just want to get the message out. Yes. And I think, um, you know, there, there are a lot of coaches who are smart. They actually film themselves mm -hmm. um, in a practice and look at that and go, how did I say that? Could I have said it better? And hopefully it, it's it's a skill as a coach because you really have to be intentional about that. But it's hard to be intentional in the heat of the moment. Without when you're it. trying to, when you're you're in a game and it's either going well or not, to stop and think, okay, I really need to make sure I give this message the right way. Yeah. Yes. And I think that goes back to what we were talking about before, um, like the nonverbal cues. And if as coaches, we're able to control our emotions a bit, uh, it's much easier to deliver um, to make sure that context is not misunderstood because it's very easy for an athlete who is struggling to hear disappointment when maybe you have zero disappointment that you're feeling, but they're already carrying that in their heart. And so the second they hear an undertone, you know, even if it's like a, a bit of a breath, they're going to think, Oh, my coach is disappointed in me or, Oh, I'm letting my partner down or, you know, oh, I'm letting my team down. And, and I think for most athletes um, and maybe especially female athletes, they're going to be more likely to beat themselves up instead of boosting themselves up. And, and that brings a, a good point where in the old days, we'd say, listen to the message and not to the way that it's delivered. <laughs> but it's yeah. really the, it's really the opposite. Yeah, it is. You can, and that's, I think we've actually done an exercise like that where um, you scream something kind at your partner. <laughs> so the message is actually really, um, Em empowering or motivating but the way you deliver it is demeaning and then you can yell something well not yell say something mean in a kind voice to your partner and they will generally feel a little bit more lifted up and, and I do completely agree that that how you deliver it um, can be if not as important as the actual message even more important than the message and again, much easier said than done during, <laughs> during, during a, a competitive situation. So I don't want to give the coaches the impression that it's, uh, you know, it's an easy skill. It is um, it's certainly not. And I, that's one thing that um, whenever I get to go watch other games, I study other coaches because mm -hmm. I'm so impressed with um, how well they're able to communicate in pressure situations or like in close basketball games, you know, it's, there's 10 seconds left and the coaches are so composed and they have the board and they're clearly articulating to the teammates uh, what's going to happen next. And I, I think that's, I love watching the games, but I really enjoy watching how coaches handle some of those pressure situations. And that's an important point. I don't think coaches um, think about like you need to practice that you're in practice. You need to put yourself in situations where you, it hopefully has like some real time experience with that. So when you get in the game, uh, you know, you, you can handle that better, whether it's okay. Say in my case, basketball, you tell your assistant, listen, I don't want to know anything you're doing. We're going to scrimmage, you know, for 15 minutes and I'm just going to have to react to what you do because I need to practice, yep. you know, adjusting and dealing with the unexpected. And I need to practice how I communicate with my players. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and like um, even setting your team up to, you know, come in and maybe the lights are off in practice and like, how do you adjust to that? Because if you show up for a match or show up for a game and, you know, there's a problem with the floor, like you are still going to be required to, to show up and compete at your, at your best. And I think as coaches, how we handle those situations too really can set the tone for our athletes, um, for, their, for their mindset and for their headspace prior to a game. Yeah, obviously modeling the behavior that you would expect is yeah. 
<laughs> and I have, yeah, I have definitely failed in that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all have. It's a lot easier said than done. A lot easier yeah. said than done. Let's move to the last piece, which is the actual message. And sure. I think that that's sometimes the hardest because we as coaches will say something and we think in our mind that it's coming out one way, but it's really not coming out that way. We don't understand why the athlete is perplexed or just, you know, upset or just doesn't understand what's going on. Yeah. Yes. We have a volunteer coach who's worked with us for the last couple of years and our athletes love when she coaches them in games. And so I have constantly asked her, what do you do? What's your secret? And she keeps everything to three points uh, because we have only 60 to 90 seconds in our timeouts. So she'll have three points for the athletes when they come in. So for as a team, she'll give them um, one thing that they're doing well and then two things that they need to do better um, or two ways to earn a point or, or to beat the other team. And so she keeps it really focused and very specific for them. So they they go through it and then the athletes recap it and then they run out to go play. And I think um, one of the most important things when we're crafting a message with regard to feedback is that we keep it short and simple. And oftentimes as coaches, we're going to see 10 different solutions. And yeah. if we can pick one, that's going to help the athletes than even saying, hey, you can do this or this, because now we're giving them again uh, where they've got to kind of choose and think through it. And I think it's almost easier if we say, hey, try this. And then they'll come back and be like, that didn't work. Okay, try this instead. Um, but the, the more concise we can keep that message, the easier it is uh, for the athletes to digest. So again, I think we've talked about this before. Like if you think of feedback as a meal, um, if you keep like little little cookies instead of cake or um, a bunch of side dishes instead of an entree, it's much easier and faster to eat um, a side dish and digest it and, and then be able to use it as fuel for your body. And I think feedback, feedback can be very much that same concept. And if we try to give an athlete an entree amount of feedback, it's uh, gonna be like Thanksgiving and they're gonna have to lay down for a little while afterwards. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll get the itis. Yeah. Um, so it and along with that though is one of the things that i learned was the very last message that you give that athlete before they go out is probably the most important because that's kind of the last thing that they process so yeah 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 so i just i, I had an experience once where i had a timeout and i told the kid uh i told the team don't foul yep Right. And immediately after the timeout, the kid goes and she fouls at a crucial yeah. time. Lucky for her, we still won the game. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I asked her afterwards because I'm always I'm examining myself. I'm like, what what was it that made you foul? And she goes, Coach, that's the last thing I heard. Yeah. So I stopped saying don't foul. And I started ending with play good defense. And yeah. it made such a huge difference in terms of uh, how they reacted. But you know, there's this theory about the sandwich where it's the, the good thing and then the um, the bad thing, the po you know, good thing, the bad thing, and then the positive. I guess you call it the yeah. sandwich or whatever. But yeah. but that to me is fascinating and, and really takes a lot of thought and, and intention when you're communicating with kids, especially in a competitive situation. It's so hard. It's so hard. Um, it, like along with that, I've learned that when you're um, like, if you're showing, so if I was to show you, okay, this is how you want to pass the ball. You want to put your hands together like this. You want your platform to look like this. That's all I'm supposed to show you. If I say what we, we don't want it to look like this with my elbows bent. And the second that I give you the visual of what we don't want it to look like, you now have that visual and you can replicate. Yeah. That. Um, and so I think the same thing is with feedback with regard to the message. One of the things that we work on in practice, um, it happens a lot when we're setting. So instead of saying that set was too tight, we want to give the setter the picture of the set that we want. So instead of saying that was too tight, we would say set me off just a little bit. Um, and so when we're asking the athletes to give each other, it's almost like the feed forward. You're trying to create or paint a picture of what you want it to look like and not what you don't want it to look like. And, and just like you said, when our athletes are saying, oh, that set was too tight. What we've realized is the sets get tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter because the setter is only hearing that was tight. That would be like tight, tight, tight. And so if we say pull the set off, pull the set off the net, pull the set off the net. 
it's much easier for the setter to respond to that because it's something concrete. And so that's, a, I completely agree with you. And it's, um, it took us a while to change gears with that on our team. But the more we talk about painting the picture of what we want instead of painting the picture of what we don't want, it certainly helps with our repeatability and our success in the practice arena. That, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, so if there's anything you can tell coaches, especially the young coaches, about feedback and, and how to get better at it, what, what would be your, your advice? I always like to end the show on advice to some yeah. coaches. Something that my dad told me from, from the time I was really, really little, he was um, in charge of sales for a company. And he always said to me, you want to praise people publicly and correct people quietly. And I think that that's such a huge piece for feedback. When you find somebody on your team who's doing it right, like it's a great time to, to point that kid out and say, hey, he or she is doing great with this and this and being as specific as possible. And then when you have the athlete who is kind of struggling to get something to pull them to the side and have a, a very quiet conversation with that athlete. So they're not feeling like all eyes are on them when they are trying hard and messing up, because I think that's so important for young people to have the courage to fail. Because like you said earlier, so much about how, how kids are tested and trained is all about being perfect these days. And there's nothing perfect about sports. And that's why sports are so incredible is because there's human error across the board. And so right. the more we can help those athletes be comfortable with their failures, the, the, more, the, quick, the more resilience they're gonna build and the quickly, more quickly they're gonna turn around and, and get the skill correct. So I think that's something that I always remember is just to praise publicly and correct quietly. That, that's great advice. Uh, if, if our coaches want to get in touch with you, how, how can they uh, do that to have a further conversation about feedback? Sure. Um, my email address is, um, it's on our website. Our website is georgiastatesports.com. And you can just look at the tab for beach volleyball, but it is B Van Fleet. My first name is Beth. My last name is Van Fleet. And that's at GSU as in Georgia State University dot edu. And that's probably the very best way to get in touch with me. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. This has been great. I love the conversations that we have yeah. um, about feedback. It's just so, so important. And I want our coaches to understand how, how important it is to be uh, intentional about that. And again, another area that has you know something to do with whether or not you're going to be successful, but not the actual sure. ball or stick or you know, on the court or on the field. So yeah, I thank, thank you so much, so much, coach. Thank you so much for having me on. I always love getting to work with you. Awesome. We'll talk to you later. Okay, listen, great information. Remember, praise publicly and criticize or coach uh, quietly. Thank you so much to Coach Beth Van Vliet uh, for the information. Obviously, um, if you have any questions, you can give her a call. Thank you for joining us this Sunday, and we will see you next week um, at the same time, 630.